I'd like to think Jesus is a great person. Uh, I just, I, it's a, it's to me, it's a silly story. Jesus is God's son, but he's also the truth. It's idolization, basically, the idea that there is a human being that can be viewed as a god. I I, I believe it, that uh, the teachings of Jesus uh, they ring true to me. This the way it makes sense to live that way. Jesus, I believe, was a liberal, and I think looking at where we're going. I think he'd be happy to see that people are becoming more and more accepting. I think I'm, I grow more curious about that every day um, uh, and, and how I can be a better person, um, maybe by following his teachings. And, and maybe it will be a, a fit for me and maybe it won't, but you know, I'll, I have a lifetime to figure that out. Well, that little video tells us quite clearly that our culture is confused, conflicted, and yet strangely attracted to Jesus all at the same time. For example, there are whole websites you can find that are devoted to the weird places that people see the image of Jesus. For example, on a piece of toast at breakfast time. Or maybe a potato chip at snack time. Better yet, in a Cheeto. <laughs> maybe in a kudzu vine attached to a telephone pole. I could have put 20 more up here. If you go look, you can find these all over the place. Uh, there are many who see Jesus as no more than a good luck charm. You might remember a classic movie called Cool Hand Luke in which Paul Newman's character sings a song called Plastic Jesus. I don't care if it rains or freezes, as long as I got my plastic Jesus sitting on the dashboard of my car. Comes in colors pink and pleasant, glows in the dark because it's iridescent. Take it with you when you travel far. Jesus has a rabbit's foot. Others use, have reduced his name to an expletive. You will hear his name uttered in anger at the office or shouted in frustration at sporting events. And when I hear that, I'm tempted to say, you know, you keep saying that name, I don't think he's playing. Our world is confused. A little conflicted, and yet strangely attracted to Jesus. Jesus is interesting. He's mysterious. He's a good luck charm. Maybe even inspiring, but Jesus as God, for many, and for maybe some of you here today, is just a bit too far. But we have to ask ourselves, of all the people who have ever walked on the face of the earth in the years, centuries before Jesus was born, and in the 2,000 years since Jesus lived, why do we still remember Jesus? him. Why does the world still number its years, much of the world number its years, from his birth? And why have his followers formed the largest and most diverse spiritual movement in the history of the world? Those are good questions. We're in part five of a seven-part series called Explore God. We've already looked at some important and difficult questions, questions like, does life have a purpose? Is there a God? Why does God allow pain and suffering? Is Christianity too narrow? If you've missed any of these weeks, just go to your Chapel Street app or the website. You can pick up those sermons and track along with us. Today we're looking at the question, is Jesus God? And when it comes to the question of who was Jesus, people in our culture largely, not exclusively, but largely fall into three categories. Uh, they take one of three views. First, the view is Jesus, well, Jesus is imaginary. He's a fictional character of religious mythology, uh, sort of like we think of uh, superheroes, like Superman or, or Spider-Man. And by the way, I think you can make a correlation uh, between the decline in belief in God over the past hundred years in our culture and the rise of fascination with superheroes. But that's a topic for a different time. The view that Jesus was imaginary, a mythological figure, is really rather rare anymore because of the vast, overwhelming evidence that a real person named Jesus really lived in history. But that's the first uh, position people take. The second position, much more common, is that Jesus was just a guy, that he really lived in real history, uh, but he was nothing more than an extraordinary example of a human being, a great teacher, maybe even a spiritual leader like Muhammad or Buddha, but nothing more than that. And that's, by and large, the, the largest view people have in our culture today. And there's a third view. 
Jesus is the eternal God who became flesh and through his death and resurrection has defeated the power of sin and death and gives hope to the world. Now, there are implications to these positions. Here are the implications. If Jesus was and is not God, then he was either himself sadly deluded or blatantly deceptive, and the largest and most global faith in human history is nothing more than mythology and essentially a lie. Even the Apostle Paul says this when he says, if Christ is not raised, your faith is futile, and we're all still in our sins. But if Jesus is God, then he has the authority not only to establish truth, but to define all of existence, including yours and mine. So today we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at what Jesus said about himself. We're going to look at what Jesus' followers believed about him. And we're going to look at what Jesus' enemies believed about him. First text we want to read today is in John chapter 14 in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus at this point is uh, nearing the end of his ministry and is beginning to prepare his disciples for his impending death. Take a look at what he says. I'll put the words on the screens. I put a few words, words in red here so you can notice them. Verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. So the first thing I want us to see here is that Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus himself claimed to be God. Now let's say for the sake of argument that after... um, 32 years here as one of the pastors at Chapel Street, that I suddenly shifted from preaching about God to preaching that, uh, that, I, that I am God. And I started saying things like, anyone who has seen me has seen God. Anybody who has heard me has heard God. Now, if I started talking like that, you would probably initially think I was try, trying some sort of elaborate sermon illustration to get you to pay attention. But if I, uh, or you might think I was just trying to be you know, humorous in some way, you think that's a little odd, even for him, and it's, it's, it's uh, kind of in poor taste. But if I insist that I kept talking like that week after week and was serious, your next response would probably be mm, concern, maybe even great concern. Uh, you'd probably start worrying about my emotional, mental health. But if I demonstrated reasonable sanity in the rest of my life, you would move from concern to sort of extreme curiosity. You'd want to see some proof. You'd, okay, okay, Pastor Brian, uh, if you are God, then do something to convince us. Do something godlike. You know, heal someone who is sick, or maybe feed the hungry, or maybe make the Cubs win another World Series. Help that field goal go through. Not. <laughs> and when I could not provide proof you would move then to a different place. You'd move to outrage. You'd say, who do you think you are? What are you talking about? You're wrong. You're phony. You're dangerous. You'd remove me from my role because I'd be committing a form of blasphemy, heresy, by proclaiming myself to be God. And interestingly, as we read the New Testament, all these things happened in the life of Jesus. Mark tells us that his family at one point thought he was out of his mind and tried to rescue him from himself. Even though he did offer proof, he was accused by others of being a sorcerer, a magician of the evil arts. Religious leaders called him a blasphemer. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And they did so because he claimed clearly to be God. And he did so first in his own words, the passage we already read, John chapter 14. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And if that's not clear enough, in John chapter 10, he says flatly, I and the Father are one. 
Now, Jesus knew that four times every day, a faithful Jew recited what's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. For him then to say, I and the Father are one, would have been profoundly disturbing and offensive to his Jewish audience. But he said it, and he said it on purpose. John chapter 8, he says, very truly I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now we first hear that, and it sounds a little strange to us. He uses the wrong tense. Shouldn't he say, before Abraham was born, I was? Even that would be a little weird. But he says, I am. And when he says the word I am, that phrase, he's doing it on purpose because that is the ancient name of God Almighty, Yahweh, Jehovah God, I am that I am, would have been shocking, offensive to his Jewish audience, and yet he uses the phrase intentionally because he knows exactly what he's saying. Secondly, he claimed to be God by his own personal character. As we read through the gospel accounts, it just jumps out at you as you read the stories of Jesus. He was compassionate to the broken. He identified with the poor and the outcast. Jesus offered forgiveness and grace to the sinful and the immoral. He confronted hypocrisy, particularly religious hypocrisy. He treated women and children with respect and dignity. He was unfailingly kind even to his enemies, and he did not discriminate against those outside of his own faith and culture. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, he committed no sin. And no deceit was found in his mouth. In Hebrews, we read, the sun was the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Even his worst enemies, when they put him on trial for his life, found nothing in his character with which to accuse him of any wrongdoing whatsoever. Nothing unseemly on his Facebook page or Instagram accounts. No embarrassing photos in his old high school yearbooks. They just accused him of claiming to be God. That was his offense, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Thirdly, Jesus claimed to be God by his deeds, the things he did. The the Gospels are full of miracle stories, and we're going to talk more about the reliability of the Gospel accounts in next week's sermon. But there are what I would call miracles of creation that are talked about. In John chapter 2, Jesus shows up at a wedding party, a wedding celebration. The host runs out of wine. Jesus tells the servants to fill the stone jars with water. Voila, the best wine they've ever tasted. He just sped up the natural processes by which grapes turn in, by which water turns into wine. He just skipped over the grapes and harvesting and fermenting part because he has authority over creation itself. In Mark chapter 8, he calms the storm on the sea by speaking directly to the wind and the waves. Just as in Genesis 1-1, God speaks and the universe comes into existence. Jesus has authority over creation itself. That's what the miracles say. Then there are miracles of healing. Story after story of Jesus restoring sight to the blind, helping the lame walk again, cleansing the leper, even raising the dead. And each time we are told that the miracle really wasn't about the healing. The miracle is about authority. That Jesus had authority over sickness, disease, even death itself. In Mark chapter 2, we see the miracle of forgiving sin. Four men lower a paralyzed friend down before Jesus, hoping he can heal him. Mark tells us, when Jesus saw their faith... He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. That's a weird thing to say to a paralyzed man, isn't it? Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus claimed to have the authority to forgive sin, and those around him knew what he was claiming. That is to be God. And finally, we see the miracle of resurrection. We're going to talk a little bit more about resurrection next week when we talk about the reliability of Scripture. But for today, for today, let me simply say that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is sort of the elephant in the room of this entire series, all seven questions. It's the elephant in the room when we talk about anything having to do with world religions because no other world religion that we know of makes such an audacious claim. Resurrection from the dead. And yet, all of Christianity... 
The entire history of Christianity hinges on this one claim, resurrection. Because if it's true, then it's the single most important fact of human history. And if it's not, we're just wasting our time. As the Bible says, by its own testimony. So, by his testimony, his own words, by his actions, by his character, through his resurrection, we are forced to one of four conclusions. Either Jesus was sort of sadly deluded, sincere, but sincerely crazy, and all of his followers since are sincerely deluded, or secondly, Jesus was a deceiver, he was a charlatan, a liar, which flies in the face of the rest of what we know of his character. Thirdly, or the New Testament record as we have it is false, that it was invented by men who later were willing to die for their invention. Or fourth, uh, he was actually who he claimed to be. And who he claimed to be was God in the flesh. That's the first thing. Second thing we want to look at today is that Jesus' followers believed he was God. Let's go back to my claim uh, to be God myself um, just for the sake of argument. And let's say you believe. Let's say I, 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 I preach that long enough and you eventually believe what I'm saying. But sadly, the rest of the world doesn't really believe. And so eventually I'm uh, arrested, thrown in jail, and then executed. But you really, really believe. And you're really sad to see all this happen. So you get together and you decide that even though I'm dead, uh, which would surely mean that I was not God, but you, 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 doesn't want to, you don't let that d discourage you. Uh, you want to create a whole new religion because you really believed what I, what I had to say. And you want to believe that, create this religion around the idea that I was indeed God. So you decide to pretend that I rose from the dead. So you dig me up. That's a little gruesome. And you hide me somewhere. And then you c decide unanimously to concoct the story of my resurrection from the dead. And then you start the rumor that I'm alive again. You write songs about me, you sing about me, uh, you start worshiping me, and you start a movement. Uh, the movement that, by the way, changes the world, overwhelms the great Roman Empire, and grows nonstop for 2,000 years. And then you agree to carry the secret that you made it up to your graves. Now, that's not a very likely scenario, do you think? I want to look at just two statements this morning. The first one takes place just a week or so after Jesus' death. It's in John chapter 20. We read, A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, what I want you to see here is one thing. Thomas makes this confession, my Lord and my God, just days after the resurrection. Now, he had real doubts before, and who wouldn't have doubts? Right? Who would, who would not have doubts? That's reasonable to have doubts about the claim of resurrection. But all those doubts are erased when he sees and touches the resurrected body of Jesus, just days after the resurrection. Fast forward a decade or so, the Apostle Paul writes this soaring passage in Colossians chapter 1. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. More eloquent language, certainly, more detailed and developed theology, but exactly the same message. Jesus is God. The God who created all things, the God who holds all things together, the God who one day will reconcile all things back to himself. This is Jesus, Paul says. Now, I want you to see how extraordinary this is. That is, Jewish men 
steeped in Jewish monotheism their entire lives, who began every day of their lives reciting the same prayer, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. Men who knew that blasphemy in their culture was a capital offense. And these men became so convinced that Jesus was indeed God that they worshiped him and bore witness to him as God, even under threat of persecution and death. That doesn't mean today that we have to believe Jesus is God, but it does mean that they believed Jesus was God. Now, I'll take a little detour here. One of the main arguments uh, today against the claim, <coughs> excuse me, that Jesus is God goes like this, that Jesus in his lifetime never intended his followers to worship him as God, that his followers only created the idea of Jesus as God a number of years after his death. That's, what, that's the main argument. And we'll talk more about it next week, but we've already seen that Jesus did, in fact, claim to be God on multiple occasions, and that the overwhelming evidence is that his followers believed him to be God immediately upon his resurrection from the dead. It didn't develop as a legend over time. There wasn't enough time for that to happen. It wasn't added in later, in the early uh, first century, in that culture, there would not have been technology available. Once the news of Jesus started to spread, once the gospel started to spread, there wasn't a technology available to, to add something to it later. There wasn't email. There wasn't uh, uh, any kind of way to do that. And the entire doctrine was in place within days of the resurrection. It would be like claiming 100 years after his death that Teddy Roosevelt wasn't just a great man and a relatively effective president, he was actually God in the flesh. If there was a group claiming that Teddy Roosevelt was in fact God in the flesh, historians, Teddy Roosevelt's family, um, and people who were fans of Teddy Roosevelt would likely step up and say, whoa, 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 time out. There's a whole bunch of evidence here that that's actually not true. You can't start saying that now because we can actually go back and we could, one, we could exhume him, two, we could look at what happened around his life. But that's what you're claiming. You're claiming it became a legend after Jesus had lived and died. The overwhelming evidence is that right from the beginning, Jesus' followers worshiped him as God. The third thing I want to talk about is Jesus' enemies. Jesus' enemies believed that he claimed he was God. Now, it's quite common in our world today, and I think we see it almost every week in the news, but it's quite common to see celebrities, whether they be athletes or politicians or movie stars or whatever, to say something or do something that gets them into, into trouble, gets them in hot water, and they have to walk back their words uh, claiming that they've been misquoted or maybe taken out of context or maybe they've just been misunderstood, that they didn't, really didn't mean it that way. We see it all the time. But when we read the story of Jesus, when he claims to be God, he gets into some very, very hot water, made him a blasphemer, and to blaspheme was punishable by death in that culture. And it would eventually be the thing that got him nailed to a Roman cross. That was the claim that got him to the cross. But when that happens, Jesus not only does not walk back his words, he actually doubles down on his words. John chapter 10 again. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. There's that line again. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Back to my fictional pretend claim uh, to be God myself. I know it may be seen to you that I'm fixated on that, but it's just an illustration. So let's say I did that, and eventually 
you know, authorities come, the guys in the white coats come and haul me off to a mental health facility where I'm going to spend the rest of my life living in a padded room, or I'm dragged into a courtroom where I'm tried, uh, convicted, and sentenced to the electric, electric chair. Let's assume that's a capital offense in our culture. Somewhere along the line, if that was happening to me, I would probably start to defend myself. I'd probably start to say things like, well, hold, hold on a second. I think you might have mis misunderstood me. I think you might have taken me a little out of context. I didn't really mean I am God. I meant I'm like God. I meant I speak for God. But when we read the New Testament, uh, it's very clear that Jesus' enemies believed that Jesus claimed clearly to be God, and that was the main reason they tried to stop him. That's the main reason why they arrested him. That's the reason they put him on trial. And that's the reason they turned him over to the Romans to be executed. And what we see is that if Jesus knew that he was not God, he certainly would have tried to clarify that. You know, I think you all misunderstood. But he never does. Not when they tried to stone him. Not when they arrested him for blasphemy. Not when he was turned over to Pontius Pilate, the Romans, to be executed. He never walked it back. He just claimed it more clearly. So why does it all matter? Why does any of it matter? Last week we addressed the question, is Christianity too narrow? Which is really a question about truth. We saw that all world religions claim truth in some way. Even atheism is a claim of truth. Even the claim that there is no truth is a claim of truth. Kind of got to wrap your mind around that one, because all truth, in essence, is exclusive in some way. So the question today really is, was Jesus telling the truth about himself? And it matters because if Jesus is God, then he has the authority to establish truth about life, death, right, wrong, as well as the eternal destiny of every human soul, yours and mine included, if he's God. Now, would that be good news or bad news? Well, it would be bad news for many of us because we want to determine truth for ourselves. You know, be your own truth. Speak your own truth. Whatever's true for you. Whatever works for you. But it would be good news because deep down we know that our own definition of truth is kind of flimsy and not really reliable and uncertain doesn't give us hope. Secondly, if Jesus is God, he has the authority to forgive sin. Now again, is this good news or bad news? Well, it's bad news because we have to admit something is wrong. Something is wrong in the world, which is quite easy for all of us to see, but something is also wrong in ourselves, which is a lot harder to admit. We have to admit that, yes, we are selfish and greedy and angry. So it's bad news in that sense. But it's good news because it tells us what's broken in us can be restored. What's wrong can be made right because our sin has already been forgiven. It's good news. Third, Jesus is God. He has the authority to grant eternal life. Now, is that good news or bad news? Well, it's bad news because we have to admit we're going to die. I hope that doesn't come as a shock to you. It's good news because Jesus tells us that death is not the end of life. As crazy as that sounds. Now here's a question. If you believe there's a God, even if you're really not sure if there's a God or not, but you think maybe out there somewhere in the vast universe and spiritual world that I don't fully understand, maybe there is. And with what you know, with what we know today about Jesus, his life, his love, his grace, his compassion, why would you not want Jesus to be that God? A month or so after I went to college, my parents moved our family from Westchester County, New York, where I grew up, to Orlando, Florida, where my dad took a new job, a place I'd never been before. So when I went home uh, for the summer after my freshman year, I went home to a place that really wasn't home. And so I really wanted to make a trip back from Orlando to New York to visit my friends because I had not seen them since I went away to school. So somehow I talked my parents into letting me drive the family car from Orlando 
to New York, a 20-hour trip with my two younger brothers in the back seat. I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> the plan was for me to drive through the night and get to New York sometime the next day. And everything went fine until about 2 in the morning, and I got pulled over somewhere in southern Georgia for doing 79 and a 55, I think, speeding. Cop pulls me over, leans in, and shows me all this stuff. My brothers are sleeping in the back seat. He showed me what I was doing, and he said, that's, son, that's a $100 fine. I didn't have the cash on me. So he took my license, took one look in the back seat, and said, you need to follow me. And he led me off the highway, off a side road, into this small town in southern Georgia, straight to the local sheriff's office. It reminded me exactly of the jail in Mayberry. You ever see the uh, Andrew Griffith show? I mean, the sheriff was sitting behind a desk, and I could see that the bars actually of the cell, that, just exactly like Mayberry. Um, and the sheriff started off something like this. You're in a heap of trouble, son. <laughs> Said 79 into 55, that's a $100 fine right there. Tell me, where are you going so fast in the middle of the night? Where are you headed so fast in the middle of the night? I'm pretty sure he thought I had stolen the car, and my brothers and I were on a joyride. Uh, I told him it's my dad's car, gave me permission, we're on our way to see some friends in New York, and then he said, well, now, let's just give your daddy a call. <laughs> he made me call my father on the old rotary phone and wake him up at 2 in the morning to tell him I was in a sheriff's office in Georgia because I'd been speeding. That's a call I did not want to make, <laughs> right? I dialed the number full of fear, embarrassment. Uh, my father answered. I could tell I woke him up. I mumbled out what had happened, and he asked me calmly but firmly, are you and your brothers okay? I said, we were all fine. And he said, give the phone back to the sheriff. I gave the phone back. I couldn't hear my dad's side. I could hear the sheriff's side. The sheriff asked a few questions. The sheriff ended up saying, yes, sir. That's right, sir. $100. And he said, yes, sir. And he hung up. He turned back to me, gave me my license, Gave me my keys and said, you be careful now, son. And let me go. I was free to go because my father had acknowledged that he indeed owned the car, that he indeed had given me permission to drive the car. He also had paid the entire fine on his credit card. And so I was free to go because my father had the authority and my father had the resources. Now, was that good news or bad news that my father had the authority? If there is a God, do you want that God to have authority? If there is a God, do you want that God to know you, to love you, and to offer you his resources? If there is a God, why would you not want that God to look like Jesus? Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you today for creating us with the hunger to know and understand where we come from, where we're going. Thank you for allowing us and inviting us to ask questions. Thank you for not leaving us alone in the dark to figure out who you are and who we are. And Lord, I know that it's quite possible that right here this morning in this room, there are some for whom this question is, is a great hurdle it's just hard for them to wrap their mind and heart around. I ask you to just meet them in their questions, in their doubts, in their fears. I ask you to overwhelm them with your grace and that in your grace, whether it's today or tomorrow or five years from now, they'll surrender to your truth and say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Amen.